Good morning. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We have been studying the subject on the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, and most recently we are studying faithfulness. And so let me give you a little bit of a review that faithfulness is for, first of all, it is being solid, firm, stable, reliable, dependable, and trustworthy. I like especially the word dependable and reliable, dependable and reliable. It also means being committed and keeping your word. Even when it's inconvenient, when it costs you, you keep your word. You are dependable. You are reliable. You are loyal. You are committed to what you say, committed to your duty, committed to your post, etc. And then we also saw, secondly, that faithfulness applies in another area in our finances. And God is testing us us in our finances. Our finances is a major area of our test with God. In 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's a stewardship. Stewardship is an old English word for management. And a steward is a manager. God is wanting to know how will we manage what he gives us? Are we a good steward or a bad steward? Are we faithful or unfaithful? And we looked at Luke 16 verses 10 through 13. He that is faithful in that which is least or little is faithful also in much. He that is unjust or dishonest in the little is unjust or dishonest in much. If you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon or money, who will commit to your trust true riches? God is testing you in how you handle your money to see if he can trust you with more. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? Your money represents your life. God is testing you in your faithfulness and obedience in your money. And then... Lastly, we have been talking about faithfulness means you don't quit. You endure hardship. You endure uncomfortable situations, unpleasant situations, tough situations without quitting, without running away and without fainting. And in Second Timothy 2, 3, it says endure hardship with us. With us, the apostles, like a good soldier. A soldier knows that he's going to have to endure hard situations, uncomfortable, unpleasant, physically, mentally, emotionally, very hard situations. And so we are to endure hardship as a good soldier. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher or developer of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured what? The cross. He became sin for us. He endured a spiritual death and a physical death. We have taught that before. Verse three, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse four, in your struggle against sin or in hard places, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't run away. Don't faint. That includes in your marriage. That includes in your job on the workplace. That includes even in church situations or in different areas of life. And there are people, especially, like I said, because of our freedom in America to move around because of how easy it is to get a divorce, because of how easy it is to move your location physically, that a lot of people will just quit, get up and leave when the going gets tough, when it's unpleasant. And we need to be careful to stay 
to stand firm and endure in hard situations. Now, yes, there are certain times when God will tell you to leave. He will tell you to move. But a lot of what people are doing is not by God's direction. It's by their flesh direction. And let me point out this. Your flesh, a lot of times, immature Christians, especially undeveloped Christians, Christians who don't really know the voice of God and the leading of the spirit, they will take the flesh desire as the leading of God. And it's not a flesh desire is not usually the leading of God. So you've got to distinguish what is your flesh and what is God. That is an area that just takes practice. You know, I can't tell you how to do it. You've got to learn for yourself. Now I did teach a lesson called how to be led by the Holy Spirit, how to know the voice of the Holy Spirit. I did teach that series. It was about a four or five week series a couple years ago. That is a major thing for every Christian to learn, to know how to be led by the Holy Spirit, to know the leadings of God. And it is major in your spiritual growth and development, knowing how to be led By the Holy Spirit, be led by God to hear the voice of God. But not only the voice of God, as I taught in that series, that a lot of times you don't hear a voice from God. A lot of times it is the inner witness of the Holy Spirit in your spirit. And there are inner promptings. Now, that's where you've got to be very careful That the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, let me say it the other way, that your flesh desires do not get mistaken as the voice or the prompting of the Spirit. Because your flesh desires are often not the promptings of the Spirit. And a lot of people are led by flesh desires fleshly responses, the way you answer in a conversation. We've been talking about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering or, or patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control that your responses need to be gentle. You need to be following the Holy spirit, controlling your tongue. And so the spiritual Christian or the mature Christian is one who follows the spirit and not the flesh. You've got to learn to distinguish between flesh and spirit. One of the keys is, is learning to know how the Holy Spirit leads you. And I taught on that and you need to learn that. How to be led by the Holy Spirit. I taught that series already. Go to my website at victoriousfaith.co. Go to the radio broadcast archives. It was a little over two years ago that I taught how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Study that. Practice it. It is major for every area of your life, even your health, your finances, your marriage, your family, your children, even your fulfillment of your high calling. Your work, every area of your life depends on you being led by the Holy Spirit. Learn that. But then also study the word. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword dividing between soul and spirit and bone and marrow. Hebrews 4 12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword or two-edged sword, double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The word of God can help you distinguish between what is your flesh and what is God. What is from the Holy Spirit? 
The word of God divides, distinguishes flesh and spirit. This says soul and spirit, but the soul is your mind, will, and emotions. And that can also then apply to fleshly desires and fleshly um, responses and to divide or distinguish or discern between what is flesh and what is God. And it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You can also say the flesh as well. It does to both. I mean, it's not, it does say heart, but it applies. It will also judge your flesh. So the word of God will help you to judge what is flesh and what is spirit or what is flesh and what is God. And so you need to be careful. This is all part of growing up spiritually. And that's the theme of this radio program this year. God is directing us to talk about growing up spiritually. There are so many Christians who are immature. They're babies. They're, they're children. They think they're big, but they're not. And as I said before, spiritual maturity does not come with time. There are, I know Christians who have been Christians for 50 years and they're still babies spiritually because they have never learned the word of God. They've never renewed their mind to the way God thinks. They have never learned to control the flesh. They're babies spiritually, even when they're 70 years old in the flesh. 70 and they're spiritually immature. And so spiritual maturity has nothing to do with time or age. It comes by diligent discipline practice to crucify the flesh and the renewing of the mind with the word of God. And that's why God is wanting his church to grow up, grow up spiritually So part of this spiritual development is enduring hardship, standing firm. And as I read to you before, 2 Timothy 2 verse 3 says, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, like a good soldier. And Hebrews 12, 7 says, says, and this is just following Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 and 4, where you have not endured to the point of shedding your blood. Consider Jesus who endured the cross. And verse 7 says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons and no discipline seems pleasant at the moment. And so, We are going through even a discipline when we are going through hardship. Now, this discipline is not punishment. Don't get the the idea of punishment when you hear discipline. But think of this discipline is like training the way an athlete trains and the way a soldier trains a soldier going through boot camp. And other follow-up training is going through a discipline, a regimented training program that is discipline. An athlete who's training for competition is going through a regimented training program. It is a discipline and it trains you while disciplining the flesh is Training your flesh to act and behave a certain way and not a bad way, but in a godly way in the godly characteristics. And part of that training takes place in hard places, in hard situations. How can you learn patience and long suffering? If you don't have to wait for periods of time, no, your patience is tra- and your long suffering is being developed by 
waiting and standing firm in hard situations, suffering or enduring long? How can you train or test or develop your joy in the Lord as a fruit of the spirit, a character of God, if you don't have opportunities to purposely be joyful, even when circumstances say there's no reason to be joyful right now. How can you practice love and exercise love when everybody around you is so sweet and loving and kind and easy to get along with? You're not really developing your love because those people are easy to get along with. Your love is developed with the people that are hard to get along with. And yet so many Christians are one, w- wanting to run away from situations that are hard, relationships that are hard to get along with, whether it's marriage, whether it's work situations and work environments, co-workers and bosses or church situations. They have not learned to endure and develop their love by loving the people that are hard to love. Your love is not developed by loving people that are easy to love. Your love is developed by loving those that are hard to love. Walking in love in unpleasant circumstances. That's where your love is developed. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, Faith, your faith is tested by standing firm. Having done all to stand, stand firm. So you see, all of these fruits of the spirit, it's like muscle building, body building. Your body muscle does not grow by only lifting five pounds, by only doing very easy physical tasks. Your muscle is developed by resisting heavy loads, by lifting the 20, the 40, the 50, even the 100 pounds. By lifting the heavy weight, that is how your muscles grow. Not by lifting light weight, not by easy tasks. No one is developed in easy tasks. You are developed in hard tasks. It's even the same thing with learning new skills. You are not going to learn by just doing the same old, same old, same old routine that you do every day. You learn by trying something that you have not done before, by doing something you've not done before, by taking on a challenge that you've never done before and you don't know how to do it. So then you've got to study it. Well, once you've studied it and you've accomplished it, now you have grown. You have grown to another level of knowledge, not by doing the same old, same old routine, but by taking on new challenges. God is wanting you to grow and develop. It requires taking on new challenges, harder challenges. It takes being staying put in hard places. That's where you are growing developed. So endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. Don't quit. Don't get up and run away. Don't faint. Ephesians 6, 13, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now going back to the idea of a soldier, think about this. If you are a soldier, you don't write your own orders. Every soldier gets his orders from his superior commanders. Every soldier gets his orders from his superior commander. We are to consider the New Testament tells us to consider ourselves as soldiers and our superior commander is God. And if you're a soldier, you get stationed where they tell you to be stationed, even if it's in the middle of the desert in Iraq If you're stationed there, you better be there. 
You can't say, well, isn't there a military base in Hawaii? I think I'd like to go to Hawaii. I'm going to go to Hawaii. And then you pack up your bags and go to Hawaii when your orders tell you to go to Iraq. And you say, well, yeah, but there's a military base in Hawaii. I want to just relax there on the base. No, you are going to be called AWOL. AWOL. That means absent without leave. If you choose to go to Hawaii when your orders send you to Iraq or Kuwait or Pakistan or any place else, you have to follow your orders. We are Christians. As Christians, we are cons- to, supposed to consider ourselves soldiers for Christ. He is our commanding officer. Go where he tells you to go. Stay when he tells you to stay. And so don't be an AWOL Christian. There's a lot of AWOL Christians out of the will of God. God has told them, I've called you to do this. And they say, but I don't like that. I don't want to do that. That God tells them, I want you to go here. And they say, but I don't want to go there. They change jobs when they want to. Because they quit and give up. They change spouses. They change churches. They don't serve the Lord where he calls them to serve in the way he calls them to serve because they follow their flesh desires. They follow what's comfortable and pleasant and what they want to do. So there really are a lot of Christians who are out of the will of God. And they're wondering why they're not blessed. They wonder why they have the problems they have. Hey, if you're out of the will of God, if God told you to be in one place and you're in a different place, you will not see the blessing of God because the blessing comes when you're in the place that he calls you to be. If he called you to be in Hawaii and you're in Colorado, then you're not going to be blessed in Colorado. If he calls you to be in Colorado and you are in another place, then you're not going to be blessed. If you're in that other place, when God called you to be here, you, the blessing comes by being in the place God assigns you learn to hear God, take your assignment from God, be there when he says, be there. Leave when he says leave, go where he says go, be obedient, show up where you're supposed to be, stay where you're stationed, do as you're told, no matter what is the cost, no matter how uncomfortable the situation, no matter how unpleasant it is, be faithful and stay for the duration Follow your commanding officer, Jesus Christ. Is it easy? No, absolutely not. It's not easy. That's why so many people are not doing it. A lot of people want to do what's easy and they're talking about what's easy on the flesh. And so they get out of the hard things. It's going to be hard. A lot of things are hard, but they are for our benefit. Even it's for our growth, our development and our blessing. God intends to bless us in the place where he calls us to be. Consider Jesus who endured the cross. Matthew 26, in Matthew 26, 38 and 39, this is before he went to the cross. Jesus said to them, his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Verse 39, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. This is the garden of Gethsemane. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will. But as you will, Jesus endured and said, not as I will, but as you will. He was willing to obey his commanding father, the the commands of his father. He did not. His flesh did not want to go to the cross. He said, if possible, take this cup from me. He sweat great drops of blood, but he yielded and submitted himself to God and said, not as I will. But as you will. And then in the similar uh, story in Luke 22, still in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Luke 22, Jesus tells the disciples to pray. And in verse 40, Jesus says in verse 40, Luke 22, 40, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And Luke 22, verse 46 
He came back and he said, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so you will not fall into temptation. You know, a lot of times we think of that being a temptation to sin. That's not what they were tempted to do. They were tempted to run away and flee when Jesus was arrested. Remember when the soldiers arrested Jesus and they fled and Peter denied Christ. The temptation was to run when it got hard, when there was danger and they failed the test. They all ran away. Temptation to what? What was their temptation? Not to fall into some sin, but their temptation was to quit, to run away and fall away from Christ and to deny Jesus when Jesus was arrested and brought to trial. And as you read in Matthew 26, Luke 22, the disciples fled. The disciples failed Jesus. And even Jesus said to Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. He said, I will not deny you. Jesus said, pray that you don't fall into temptation. But they fell asleep. And when that when they were asking Peter, you were with him. He said, no, I don't know the man. He denied the Lord and he failed the test because it got hard and fearful and his own life was at risk. They failed. Pray that you don't fall into temptation. Pray that you don't quit, that you follow all the way through and you are faithful to the end. Be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be faithful to his call. Be faithful to his commission on your life. Now join me again tomorrow. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.